And I would like to welcome you in our panel on the remaking of the World Trade Order. There is actually a reason why our panel follows Mr. Deputy Minister's talk on the value of academic diplomacy. If it was not already complicated two to three years ago, the worsening uh, environment of world trade relations has made the activities in economic diplomacy a much harder task for its practitioners today. One could, however, say that the value added of this public policy has increased paradoxically, especially in small and open economies, because its economic, their economic success depends on the quality of its practice even more today. Uh, our panel of researchers experienced uh, in world trade issues can do one humble thing, that is to provide a bigger picture of the processes, both economic and political, going on in world trade issues, which are actually important to know for economic diplomacy practitioners. That is why I'm happy that well, we could invite four honorary guests to the panel, to today's panel. I would start with introducing Teresa Novotna, who is a um, Marie Skludovska career researcher at the Otto Sur Institute for Political Studies of Freie Universität Berlin, and also senior researcher at the European Institute here in Prague. The second is uh, Juraj Sipko, a director of the Institute of Economic Research at the Slovak Academy of Sciences in Bratislava. Uh, the third on my left is Willem Semel, who is a researcher at the Insti Economics Institute of Czech Academy of Sciences and a senior lecturer at the Institute of Economic Studies of the Charles University in Prague. And on my right, finally, Anne Melchior, a senior research fellow at the NUPI, Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, based in Oslo. So thank you all for coming to Prague and uh, your willingness to discuss the precarious situation of the world trade order we have inherited and we have to suffer through uh, these days. I would say that our panel will follow the standard proceedings of initial remarks, panel debate, and then we will finish with the questions from the audience. Uh, I hope that we address two broader issues. First, we could discuss individual protectionist examples of deviance from the rule-based and liberal trade order and try to find out whether and what sort of global trend challenges the contemporary framework fixed by the WTO, the World Trade Organization. And the second, I hope that we will debate how this trend challenges Europe and its small and open economies, such as Slovakia, such as Czechia, and such as Norway, and how these economies shall and could respond to this trend. So what is my final wish? I would like to hand the floor to Juraj Sipko. I got it. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, dear panelists, colleagues, I have privilege to be here and to express my, my personal opinion about uh, the development of international trade, including measures and strategy. Uh, in order to give you a clear picture, I would like to start with this agenda, what was happened at the end of the Second World War. At the end of the Second World War, that has been created Brutenwood Institution, International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. Both, they wanted to support international trade, international payment, growing standard of living, and security in the world. In order to follow this agenda since July 1944, since April 1947 has been introduced new agenda and this called 
international trade. <clears throat> so the first meeting was in Geneva, April 1947, and they discussed how to facilitate trade, but in particular, how to reduce the tariffs. So during those days, there have been 23 countries which signed the agreement, and up to, up to adopting the World Trade Organization, I mean the 1st January of 1995, they have been eight rounds. All rounds, they were very successful. The most successful rounds, they started, to, started in May, in May uh, 1990, uh, uh, 1964, and this round is called Kennedy Round. And Kennedy, he was one of the most prominent uh, American president who strongly supported uh, inter Atlantic cooperation, and he also supported strong process of liberalization, mainly concentrated on reducing tariffs, but as well as he introduced also, under the, this agenda, they introduced also anti-dumping measure. When the first round of negotiation participated 23 countries, and it took seven months, uh, Kennedy around participated 47 countries and 37 Months. So we might recognize how agenda was growing. At the same time, it was more countries and more proposal because under the umbrella of WTOs, it's called uh, Unimos system. So they should all countries agree with the proposal. Then we move to September 1973. Tokyo round was very successful. Almost 300 billion volume of world trade has been reduced by using these tariffs and it was very successful but if we compare with the Kennedy rounds it was uh, no 40, 48 but 103 countries and it was and it took 74 months then the last and the most successful round of negotiation it was in uh, Punta El de Este in Uruguay and this is historical one. Why? Because at the end of this negotiation, which took 87 months and 123 countries participated, they moved from uh, general agreement and trade to new uh, international organization and its World Trade Organization. What it was the most important here, they accept tariffs, uh, non-quantitative measures, they, they discuss uh, also services, general trainer services, in addition to they discuss competition, they discuss also intellectual property rights, but the most important is what they adopted during the, the aid runs, it was dispute settlement. Why? Because this dispute settlement is the main or core principle of the international trade. During the GATT agreement, the dispute settlement, uh, they started, but they didn't finish. But based on the agenda of WTO, they adopted measure that each dispute they should be terminated, and it was. So it was very successful. My opinion about the whole process was very successful during the uh, under umbrella of general agreement uh, trade and services. But then we, when we move to further, and since 1995, the more member countries joined to WTO, at the same time they were coming China, Russia, and the process of voting, it was more complicated. So the first very promising agenda, it was Doha agreement. They started in November 2001, but so far they didn't finish this agenda. It was very simple, mostly for, for uh, uh, developing countries, and they deal market access, agriculture, and so on. So up to now, no progress. Why? Because now we have 164 countries and the countries they have 
or almost rich countries, they have their own ambition, mostly who? The United States. And uh, I, would, I would like to say here that no progress has been made since, since uh, 2001. And it was very promising in uh, September, it's so in Seoul uh, 2011, that this agenda will be, will be uh, finalized, but unfortunately they didn't. But what it was the most successful during those period of time in, uh, in December, December 7, 2030, there has been a concluded agreement of facilitation of trade, one of the most agreement which is necessary in order to eliminate, uh, eliminate so-called administrative, uh, administrative barriers. So now, in, in September, we have here the 22nd of September, and the most critical, as I mentioned, is just dispute settlement, and uh, we have uh, so-called uh, appellate body, they are member of seven, seven member, very prominent professionals. We have only three. And if on December 19, they will be not supported by the US, US actually stopped, still it's functioning, but they will, they will renew the term. But if United States will not support, then the main or core principle of double, double, uh, double TO, it will be strongly undermined. We have a couple of months, but still there is no sign that from the US side they will be, they will be any will to continue to support this agenda. So the question is, what after that? The answer is to build a new system which should concentrate for many new aspects of the present development of the international trade, but at the same time, what are the new issues? We have, we have actually uncertainties. They are related to mostly to accumulation of debt as a heritage of the global financial crisis. Then we have, in addition to, we have also huge income inequality, which is undermining demand. And when it's lowering the demand, it's always uh, reducing the GDP. And then, as always, geopolitical trends. But there are risks. But we have threats. We have two huge threats. The first one is related to digitalization for industrial revolution. Uh, robotization as well as to artificial intelligence. Historically, all, always industrial and technological changes, they, they help the nations. But the question is how digital trade, e-commerce will help if we are not going to sell income inequality around the globe because income inequality is growing. And then it brings me to the critical point and to the climate change. We know that technology we might regulate, but we cannot regulate so far climate change. And climate change will have huge impact for macroeconomic policy, for microeconomic policy, for financial sector, and for everything. So the answer, what should be the future of the new reform of WTO is agenda, what I mentioned here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you very much. We got an overview from the beginning to the end and the prospects of new future. That was very inspiring. Uh, I would like to ask Arne to comment on the failure and in the shadow of Trump and Brexit, as is the title of your book. So if you could comment on this. Yes, my presentation, yes. Okay, thank, thank you. you.
1968. So that was my first um, acquaintance. I have never, actually never been to the Czech Republic before, so thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. So uh, <clears throat> I was asked to speak about uh, the current crisis in trade policy and the WTO. So my presentation will <clears throat> be on that and a bit broader than my own research, although uh, to a large extent based on uh, work that I've been doing myself uh, over the years and recently especially. So the WTO has received a lot of criticism for being a failure, it cannot make reforms, etc. So then it's very good to remember that uh, uh, there are very strong aspects of success with the WTO. So on trading goods, which is a big chunk of uh, world trade still, uh, the WTO basically rules the ground. So it is true that you have a growth in free trade agreements, uh, but just a minority of them, like the European Economic Area, the EU, go much beyond the WTO. Uh, the rest, they don't go so much further. It is true that they are, have deeper tariff cuts, but that is partly because the WTO requires them to do so. You have to liberalize 90% if you make an FTA. Furthermore, in this book you mentioned, uh, I, I also counted the free trade agreement. So for the 40 biggest countries in terms of the economy or population, uh, about one quarter of the bilateral links are covered by free trade agreements. So even in this uh, group of more advanced economies mainly, uh, just one quarter is covered by bilaterals, and if you take the whole world, including Africa, just a small fraction of the bilateral links are actually covered by FTAs. So WTO rules on goods trade. There, is, there are binding rules on intellectual property. So why did China change its intellectual property laws? They did when they joined the WTO, and according to some of the IPR experts, China is on paper uh, acceptable in terms of IPR. There are problems of implementation, yes, and this is uh, one of the key issues in the current conflicts, but uh, WTO creates new rules, controversial, they were against uh, developing countries, uh, according to prominent economists like Stiglitz and others, but they created rules. And, of course, the, the dispute settlement, which is almost too good to be true, now the almost is in jeopardy too here, but, uh, but it's, uh, I, it, it, you, you have a, a system which is respected by small and large countries alike and which has functioned. When it was created, there was a doubt that countries would not respect uh, the, the decisions, but, uh, but it has functioned very well and, and uh, decisions have been uh, uh, respected. And the ser on, on services trade, the success of the WTO is more mixed. Uh, so the real steps forward in terms of liberalization uh, are not so, uh, so clear in the field of services, and the progress in current negotiations have been weak. Uh, WTO also got 30, more than 30 new members since it was established in 95, so it's virtually global. So a couple of countries in the Middle East are, mis are, are lacking for historical reasons, but on the whole, this is a totally global institution. So that's the success of the WTO, but then there are, of course, the failures which are well known. The lack of dynamism since 1995, after the Uruguay round and the establishment of WTO. There are new issues arising in history with globalization, digitization, etc., and the WTO is slow with 164 members and, and uh, negotiations that failed. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, the lack of progress on services trade, the new issues are taboo. We have had multinationals for 70 years. They are dominating the world economy. We should have an agreement on investment not only investment protection, but on the investment, but that's taboo. After the MAI or OECD failed around the turn of the century, uh, it cannot be uh, uh, reactivated. Uh, uh, and there is a lack of vision. It is the muddling through in Geneva, and when it's not even going through, as with the so-called Doha round, it becomes uh, more muddling. 
So that is a problem. You don't have hegemons to set the order and make the constructive new proposals. So <clears throat> on the conflicts, to go to the, the heart of the current the strifes uh, about China and the USA. This is, of course, uh, many things to say. Uh, a, a kind of brief summary, also, also uh, drawing on some other sources, that China, uh, they made significant trade reform upon accession. It was a big institutional change for China. Reduces, it reduced its tariffs to about 10%. Uh, and it has made, if you read the trade policy reviews coming biannually from the WTO, it has improved its trade regime further. Uh, there are problems with subsidies, state enterprises, and intellectual property rights. You can read the aluminium report. Aluminium report from the OECD uh, works on state-owned enterprises, uh, hidden subsidies, etc. Uh, constitutes a problem. Uh, the, should, it should be mentioned that some of these fields are kind of uh, not, it's not clear how far the WTO rules stretch. So there is a gray area of what is kind of bad practice and what is not covered by WTO. Uh, China has signaled a willingness of reform, but there will be communism still. And of course, this is a different animal with a party organization with 88 million people in every factory, every municipality, every organization. It's a different economy. And that will remain if the CPC gets its uh, will. Uh, of course, the United States was one of the, the great founders of WTO, the drivers in the process, the reformers, the hegemons. Under, under, in the current regime, this does not apply anymore. Uh, Mr. Trump has <coughs> expressed a dislike of multilateral governance in the General Assembly of the United Nations. Uh, there is, a, of course, a kind of real uh, cultural difference between Europe and the USA uh, in, this, in the view on international jurisdiction, where we are used in Europe to being judicialized, whereas in the United States there is a more reserved attitude. So, so this is a dilemma far beyond Trump, but it's, uh, so that's uh, one of the issues. Trump has threatened to leave, and he said he would rip apart trade agreements. Uh, as mentioned, the United States blocks the appointment of new members of the appellate body, and this will come to a close or, or a block in December, if not changed. The trade measures are partly illegal. I mean, the, you can complain on China if you win the case. You can have measures and you can have temporary measures, but you cannot just have 25 tariffs on all uh, because you don't like China. That's uh, illegal. Uh, there is also some disrespect for legal practice in the WTO. WTO is rules and norms about their, uh, their interpretation. And of course, uh, when you <coughs> when you use the, refer, refer to the security clause in a very loose way, uh, look at the United States defense on the so-called Section 301 measures on China, it's not fully credible. So that is the, uh, uh, the, the WTO story. Underlying this is the narrative that uh, China, by kind of unfair trade, created the American uh, economic problems. So I will be I don't have time to go much into this. The graph here shows uh, the U.S. trade deficit for goods measured by an index from plus 100 if you just export to minus if you just import. And the red curve is with China and the blue is with China out of the data. So they look very, very similar. So it shows that the U.S. trade deficit is not a China problem. It has become bigger because of China's growth, but it's because of other things. Uh, either the world, all the world was cheating, or there was something about the United States uh, productivity and macroeconomics that created it. So is there a solution in the, to the crisis? In the short term, since this kind of uh, immediate crisis was created by the USA, in a sense, uh, the USA has the solution. Uh, so I think on dispute settlement, there are many proposals floating around, and it is technically possible to have a solution uh, that also meets some of the American 
critique that uh, that there is kind of uh, bending the rules through the interpretation of law in the cases so i think there is there is a common ground so if there is a willingness it would be possible in my opinion uh, the antagonism with China has, of course, created disputes, the steel and aluminum tariffs, a flow of a flurry of, uh, of uh, complaints and counter complaints and countermeasures and complaints on the countermeasures and subsidies for the farmers and complaints on the subsidies, etc. So this is a quagmire, but if you eliminate those measures, it will all be fine. So if U.S. makes a deal with China, they can kind of erase the legal swamp, uh, the, the legal quagmire. So there is antagonism uh, and there is a gloom at the moment. And the USA has a lot of friends and power and uh, tries to influence other countries. So, so what happens is not clear. And um, you can read uh, uh, Navarro and uh, the interviews with Steve Bannon about the origins of U.S. trade policy, and I will not go uh, into the total depth of this now. In the long term, of course, there are many uh, issues that are not at all due to uh, the current regime. So there is no quick fix. Uh, just briefly, I would say that the so-called special and differential treatment for developing countries needs a better underpinning. So it was suggested by UNCTAD's General Secretary, Raoul Prebisch, in 1964. And essentially, there has not been many new thoughts since. There's been a lot of complaints and papers that it doesn't work. But why should we have it? Does China need support for industrialization from the USA or Norway? Probably not. So, but this needs a rethink. There, is, there are still development issues. Uh, the new issues are taboo, and they are not likely to be solved immediately in the WTO. So we have to go for plurilaterals or mega-regionals. And uh, in my opinion, China should be uh, integrated and participating because they are a kind of important participant in the world economy. So, so the conclusion is that I think I have spent almost my time. Huh? Yes, in moment. Okay, very good. So, so uh, <clears throat> the conclusion is that WTO is a great success in, in spite of its shortcomings. It's kind of a miracle that you have such peaceful conflict resolution in a complex area with 164 small and large, small and large countries uh, in difficult areas. Uh, so we should fight to kind of uh, retain uh, this WTO system. And there are some problems with China, uh, but it's currently the United States that puts on the edge uh, this conflict and violates some of the norms and even rules of the WTO. Uh, so the EU has to find the right balance. Some say that we should uh, choose side and go for the TTIP light and push China. In. I think it's important to balance and to have a, the, a kind of balanced view on what is good for the WTO. And of course, as we know, TTIP is also good, so we should strive for uh, integration with the US as well. And the plurilaterals are necessary to address the new issues, but we can demand more reciprocity from China. So this is actually a message from trade research since 1980. Before that, you should just liberalize and everything would be fine. And if you were met by uh, barriers, you should uh, uh, not retaliate. But uh, according to all the new trade theory, there is a cost of non-reciprocity. And this cost is harder to bear in periods with slower growth in the West. So this is a real issue. And China develops fast. It's the ruling on goods uh, manufacturing exports. So we should uh, request more reciprocity from China. And finally, yes, the, the, some of these arguments are supported in this book from last year. In the book is also uh, uh, presented some more evidence to the effect that, that uh, international trade is particularly important for small countries like Czech Republic and Norway and others. So uh, this is in economic terms, but also in political terms. Of course, uh, some of the uh, 
resistance against uh, multilateralism is that there should be big power politics and the large countries should, uh, should uh, negotiate bilateral. So uh, multilateralism is important both for the economic and for the trade policy reasons for the smaller countries. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we have at least an agreement that WTO is not a failure. And at the same time, it's a useful framework for future cooperation still, despite many voices in world politics that it isn't. And thank you for also inquiring into the Chinese-American uh, dispute and bringing it into the framework of WTO. And I think that uh, with the next contribution by uh, Willem Semenak, we will move back to Europe, but still stick to the WTO. although many of us would deserve it. I guess the schedule was pretty busy today. So uh, it's not easy to speak after my predecessors mentioned many of the obvious problems of the WTO. So I will try to be a little bit more speculative in what I will try to discuss here today. So uh, as Dr. Sh uh, Shipko and Arne mentioned, there are many visible features of the problem. Arne also spent some time with the possible deeper fundamental causes. I believe that this problem is important. There are some visible issues, like the problem with the appellation body, uh, appellate body, and deeper issues, which may be hidden under the surface. Arne touched briefly the issue that there is no longer the he hegemon that would be pushing through liberalization as the United States once did. In fact, I would also agree that the changing nature and uh, relative power of individual groups of states matters a lot. Second, I would also agree that the WTO definitely was not a failure, quite to the opposite, but we have reached, um, uh, we have reached the times when there is actually a conflict between additional deep liberalization, especially in the form of removing additional non-tariff barriers and national sovereignty. Uh, if you look at the debates about the TTIP, it was actually immensely difficult to go beyond what has been achieved under the WTO framework. Uh, I would also agree that the attitude to trade and trade theory changed significantly in the past years. It's not just only about trade theory, about the fact that if you take some trade models and you change utility functions and a few assumptions about technologies, you are getting perhaps a less, uh, a less brilliant additional positive welfare effects of trade, but we have also seen additional interesting re-evaluation, for instance, of the experience of the large depression. Most economists today believe that the 1930s extreme economic crisis was not really linked that much to trade. It was largely linked to significant policy errors, especially of central banks and of national governments. Uh, economists such as Roderick, but also the public, have increasingly emphasized, either at the public level, this satisfaction with results of globalization, or at the official level, some increasing uh, mistrust into the automatic mantras describing that it's always liberalization that will help. And last but not least, indirectly mentioned again by Arne before me, there is the issue of uh, something which is closely linked to the a 30 years anniversary that we will be celebrating soon in this country. When the WTO was put into effect, when uh, the GATT agreement was signed at the end of the Doha round, that was the first half of the decade of 1990s. The world was much more optimistic about the future. We were reading Fukuyama's End of History. Everybody assumed that there is this one global liberal market democratic model to which everybody will converge, including China, after that intermezzo of Tiananmen was expected sooner or later to converge to the same framework. Now we know that it's not quite so easy. 30 years later, we are observing a world 
with increasing role of a system that we can perhaps best describe as so-called state capitalism. State, a system where the state and economic sectors are very narrowly interrelated. Fortunately, we have got very nice economic models of how the system works, thanks to Janos Kornai and other economists. We know what it typically leads to. It often leads to problems with efficiency of state enterprises or enterprises shielded by government protection. And in turn, this generates additional demand for assistance, which is often provided because it seems to be the rational solution of the model. All this is known as so-called sub-budget constraints syndrome. So we are pretty much sure that plenty of the countries that are testing the system, whether we are talking about Russia, about China, about Brazil and other large players, will be in future struggling with domestic troubles that can be exemplified by the current debt problems and efficiency problems of many uh, Chinese entities, which they may be tempted to solve at the expense of other countries not simply by subsidies, but mix of hidden protectionism and subsidies. Uh, what does it mean? If there are really, really deeper problems of what we are observing now, then finding a compromise which currently satisfies the United States and maybe appointing somebody in November to the appellate body will not truly solve the problem. It will just postpone additional troubles or dilute the existing troubles at the moment. Uh, second issue, some of the complaints of the United States, some of the uh, prospects that China would like to have in the WTO, uh, some of what the developing countries have got used to under the WTO, there simply doesn't seem to be that easy compromise to reach in the long run. And finally, even if you are hoping that some miraculous change maybe a regime change in one of the great uh, state capitalism countries or new elections in the United States will help us, this is not so probable either. When we look at the history of US trade policy since 19th centuries, uh, we can notice that there were often periods of relative stability of trade policies. They typically did not change until there was some significant change at the political level, and the change at political level often happened as a result of crises. In fact, purely based on economic factors, there's a good chance that Mr. Trump will continue in his position in 2020. And if he doesn't, that will be because of a possible recession or crisis, which would be at the same time also preventing or reducing the motivation for sudden deeper change in the uh, nature of US trade policy. Similarly, in the case of state capitalism countries, we may have valid economic reasons to expect that China, Russia, and other uh, markets will have to change sooner or later. My favorite book in this case is by uh, Gordon Chang, a really good expert on China, who published in 2001 a book called The Coming Collapse of China. He's mentioning arguments which are valid, correct. They were valid at that time, they are valid now. But the collapse is not coming. This is the kind of system which can survive for decades and we as economists are not really good at predicting when it will, fall. it will fall. What does it mean? The EU must prepare for a different future. It cannot simply hope that a simple change in a policy or some miracle at elections will solve the problems in, into which we are getting ourselves. Fortunately for us, the EU is not in such a bad situation. We are used to seeing the EU as a relatively weak actor. But as it has been mentioned already, partly thanks to a relatively extensive network of FTAs, but also thanks to the fact that EU as a whole is relatively closed, thanks to a huge share of intra-EU trade, all this can mean that we can be relatively less vulnerable to sudden external shocks than many other regions. Uh, what else? What are the options then? Uh, using uh, the terminology which I brought from a recent paper uh, by Dadush and, uh, and Wolf, we can perhaps see at least two basic futures or scenarios of what can happen uh, w with the EU's position to the, in the WTO and with, global, uh, with the future of global trade. So option A, we somehow manage to repair the current system. It will continue maybe in a kind of muddling through way, very gradually we'll be working out of the troubles. We will eventually manage to integrate or reintegrate China into the system properly. Uh, 
Uh, what this requires, probably, this requires that we avoid deeper economic troubles. If a recession hits global economy in the near future, it will be very tough to sell this scenario to voters. Uh, we should also uh, expect that this may, might happen only if we uh, manage to avoid the escalation of political conflicts between the US and China. Again, this is an issue which is difficult to predict. Uh, the United States would somehow have to find a mo a, the right set of motives to moderate the, the demands. And maybe the China should have additional reasons to continue their belief that their participation in their current global trade framework really is beneficial for them. I'm not quite sure that the current development in the WTO gives them always the right motivation concerning the future. So this would be the case when the, uh, when the future, when the WTO survives to the future. It's not a trouble-free case. There is a danger, danger as well. As we are currently seeing in the case of, for instance, United Nations, some countries, for instance, China again, can decide that the system is so valuable for them that they not only want to participate, but they may want to play an even bigger role and to some extent take over. Just look at the number of United Nations agencies which are currently significantly dependent on funding partly provided by China or which are led by officials originating from China. What does it mean for the EU? There is a non-negligible risk that we may be having some WTO in future, but we may not be exactly happy about the results it will be providing. Some such cases happened in the past. For instance, uh, the dispute over rectopamine, the growth hormone that Europeans didn't want to have in their, in their food. And thanks to uh, the existence of coalition of other countries, there was at least uh, to some extent uh, a decision reached at the WTO that the growth hormone should not be banned, that it was a protectionist measure. So that would be the first option. The second option or the second scenario for the world would be that we should prepare for the breakup of that multilateral system. Now, this brings some op options again. It can be a complete chaos, but what may be a bit more likely would be, and more desirable for us, would be the fact that we would be experiencing global uh, increase in instability, but with some islands of rules-based approach, possibly based, based on plurilateral agreements, uh, the divided global economy would not be a new or the only or the first such case. We can all remember what Dr. Shipke men mentioned before, the case of GATT in the early 1950s, where again the world was divided into economies which are more or less compatible in their objectives and the rest of the world. It's true that some socialist countries participated in the framework, but they were not truly integral part of that. Uh, possible features of this, so there will be relatively coherent rules between group of developed market liberal economies, and at a global level, there would be some compromises based on power balances on uh, the realization that we can't really defeat each other, that we are to some extent dependent, that would be restricting the deeper trade crises. So, uh, what would be the features of this global model? Probably absence of a formal dispute resolution, resolution body at global level. That would be a great loss, but in fact, if we don't have a mechanism that would be usable, it doesn't have to be such a bad loss. There will be probably attempts at reciprocity. Uh, it's quite probable that we would not lose completely some of the features of current systems, such as the most favorite nation clause, because as many of us know, it predates the creation of WTO and GATT. Many countries are using most favorite nation clauses, unconditional uh, most favorite nation clauses, in their trade agreements in 1920s and 1930s, often for practical game theoretical reason. And probably you'll be seeing a world with much more active use of trade defense mechanisms to which the EU should be able to respond. Dangerous? Initially, it's likely to be a bit more chaotic system before everybody learns the rules of, of the game. There may be even increased risk of non-economic conflicts, reversing the logic so much uh, emphasized by uh, Cordell Hull in the 1930s and 1940s, according to him, trade should eliminate causes for conflicts. Obviously, reducing trade, increasing trade barriers can take us in the other direction. 
So both option A and option B actually mean some prerequisites for the EU. If the EU wants to be able to successfully uh, promote the reform of WTO that would be appealing to other large players, or if it wants to succeed in the newly fragmented world, the EU must be strong enough and relevant enough global actor. We are back to the debate that has been waged at EU institutions for the past 20 years, how to turn the EU into a relevant global player. And frankly, it seems, not just according to what European economists are discussing, but also according to what the US economists are discussing and US political scientists with respect to the chances to preserve important global role of the US, that we need to make sure that we are economically strong, we are economically united, and we need to invest into seemingly unrelated issues such as research and uh, development and education. Only if we are competitive, if we have something interesting to offer, if we have got strong internal market, we can have some chance of dictate, dictating the rules of global game. If you are small, weak, divided, obsessed with internal troubles, if you have no interesting technologies, no interesting products to offer, uh, why should we be able to succeed in similar negotiations? So in a way, perhaps we should see this as an opportunity. These are factors that we have been trying to achieve in Europe for a long time. Now we really may need them to preserve our position on the global stage, regardless of whether this option B or option A will eventually uh, appear. I wanted to speak about the position of new member states, but there is too late for that. So just a conclusion, we should consider the uh, situation B as a credible alternative. Situations with chaotic and indeed crazy ideas about international trade policies have happened in the past. At the same time, we should not perhaps be extremely afraid of that. It's true that we are all dependent on trade. It's true that trade is important for all of us. But at the same time, at least some of the estimates uh, suggest that a uh, significant increase in standard trade barriers doesn't have to cause a kind of cataclysmic economic crisis that we sometimes expect these to bring. And in the end, uh, what, we, what we are likely to expect, the breakup of global trade will mean increased tendency to regionalization that we are already uh, observing. And the EU, if it wants to succeed, needs to reform first itself and then to think about trade policies and international policy. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for joining the consensus on our contributions of WTO to, to the world and that they are positive and maybe sometimes underestimated. And now with Teresa Novotna, we will establish the bridge from Europe back to East Asia, if I'm not wrong. So. Uh, Hello. Uh, first of all, I will stay here. And not only that I have my laptop here, but uh, I'm not that tall, so I think you have actually better chance to see me here than behind a, a tall lectern. Um, thank you very much uh, to Daniel for inviting me to this panel and uh, to Alice for uh, inviting me to the uh, conference. Um, I should point out that I am not a political economist or economist as my uh, uh, fellow co-panelists, uh, but I'm rather a political scientist. So uh, I will look at various trends in, uh, in trade um, and the transformation of the world order more from the geopolitical uh, perspective rather than from you know, detailed economic perspective. Um, I will, I will talk about Asia, but uh, I think uh, I can't avoid uh, talking about uh, the EU and the US as well. Uh, and of course, I don't want to repeat uh, what has already been said, so uh, I will try to um, kind of um, um, improvise a little bit and maybe react to some of the points which have been raised in this panel, but also uh, previously uh, there was a very nice panel in the morning uh, on Asia in, in the other room. So I would like to touch upon uh, three key issues or three key challenges which I think um, are now facing or the, the world trade order is facing now. Uh, 
uh, and uh, the first one is uh, politicization of trade. So nowadays we see more and more blurred lines between trade and the politics. The second challenge is weaponization of trade. And the third one I would call a bilateralization of trade. Uh, I will try to provide a few examples uh, to each of these uh, uh, challenges. Um, and I will look primarily at Asia, but at the end I would also like to come back uh, to Europe, to the EU. Um, so first of all, uh, politicization, politicization of trade or the spillover between uh, uh, trade, economics and politics. Um, I think especially when we talk about Asia, uh, we quite often uh, talk about the so-called Asia paradox. Uh, which is that in Asia you would have uh, quite good economic uh, ties between the countries, uh, but these good economic ties had existed with uh, relatively bad uh, political relations side by side. Um, and to some extent these two worlds were sort of separate. Well, this is no longer true. It's not uh, true for uh, Asia. It's not uh, no longer true for uh, other parts of the world. Um, why is this? Uh, lots of my uh, fellow uh, uh, speakers uh, touch upon the, uh, the, uh, the growth and growing assertiveness uh, of uh, China. We had uh, quite an extensive discussion uh, on uh, Belt and uh, Road is initiative in the previous panel. So that's definitely a case in point. Obviously, lots of people have mentioned uh, uh, the uh, Donald Trump's America First uh, policy and sort of undoing of uh, everything traditional uh, and sort of uh, the insulation of trade uh, from politics uh, that, that has uh, accelerated under this current uh, US administration. Uh, but uh, this politicization of trade uh, has uh, uh, come before Trump, so we shouldn't blame everything on him. Um, and uh, we shouldn't forget that uh, during the TTIP negotiations, which were uh, mentioned several times, uh, the, the, the agreement has been very much politicized here in Europe, much more here than in the United States. Uh, Czech Republic probably wasn't the, the main uh, country of which, which, which would be doing so, but uh, Germany and France certainly were, Austria possibly as well. But it wasn't just uh, the TTIP, it was also TPP, so the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and uh, there were lots of political protests in Japan against uh, this agreement uh, for quite similar reasons. So in a way, uh, people have started paying attention to trade much, uh, much before than uh, the, the latest uh, changes um, in, in between the uh, US and China. Um, the other aspect I would like to mention is the weaponization of trade. Um, Again, we could say that uh, President Trump has uh, sort of uh, perfected this. He calls himself a tariff man. Uh, imposing tariff is his weapon of choice, not just against China, but obviously uh, we will see, but probably against the EU as well. But uh, there were threats also against Canada before the, the new NAFTA has been uh, negotiated and so on. Um, but again, uh, weaponization of trade didn't come just with uh, this current administration. Uh, in Asia, in uh, 2016, um, uh, where there was a dispute uh, about uh, um, uh, thought, so that would be the in-time missile system, which would have been based in uh, South Korea, China at the time reacted uh, with uh, trade uh, um, um, in, in using trade as kind of retaliation against South Korea, so basically a huge boycott of South Korean products, and also using uh, its other favorite tool, uh, tourism, so basically uh, preventing Chinese tourists uh, coming to South Korea and therefore uh, impacting uh, the South, uh, South Korea-China uh, relationship. But quite recently, weaponization uh, of trade has also uh, been, uh, been used in uh, bilateral, uh, other bilateral relationships. 
Um, and uh, I would mention um, uh, the most recent Japan-South Korea uh, dispute, uh, which started off uh, with uh, very political decision uh, about uh, the so-called comfort men, women, so the, uh, the, the issue whether um, the, the, the Korean women who were used uh, uh, by Japanese uh, soldiers for uh, sexual services during uh, the um, World War II, uh, whether they have a right of individual reparations or not, and the, uh, the uh, South Korean Supreme Court decided that they do. And Japan reacted uh, not politically, but in the trade arena, that is uh, removing uh, South Korea from the list of preferred trade partners and uh, um, increasing export controls for sales of raw materials uh, which are needed for South Korean uh, companies such as Samsung, LG, uh, to, to produce semiconductors. And this conflict is spilling over. South Korea is reacting in a similar way. There is also a Korean boycott of Japanese goods and so on and so on. So in a way, these two aspects which I mentioned, the politicization of trade and weaponization of trade are quite intertwined. One, one goes from the economic sphere to the political one, the other one goes from the political uh, to the economic one. But nevertheless, uh, they, uh, in terms of trade, they create uh, wasteful, inefficient trade diversions, and in the political arena, of course, they create um, political conflicts, uh, increased nationaliz uh, nationalism, populism, and so on. Um, the last aspect, which I'm not going to go too much into detail because we've already discussed it quite a bit, is a kind of a palatalization of trade. So um, it's not just uh, the, the role of WTO, uh, but also um, Arne was talking about um, uh, the uh, various FTAs uh, around the world. Um, and we see that uh, there is kind of a return to, uh, to an effort to have bilateral uh, agreements, if you have any at all. Um, so where does the EU fit into this? Um, and actually, I think EU is probably uh, sort of the more positive uh, story, so it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, and. Uh, the EU is uh, doing its bilateral uh, uh, rela uh, relationships, its bilateral FTAs, but it's doing it in a way that it's creating sort of a network. Uh, so uh, when it comes to China, uh, we should mention quite a successful um, EU-China summit in Brussels in April this year, where there was a final statement that included lots of, uh, lots of issues that the United States actually wants from China. Uh, it even uh, related back to uh, politic, uh, po uh, human rights dialogue, which was also included. Um, just uh, a week, two weeks ago, uh, Angela Merkel visited uh, Beijing with a huge uh, business de delegation, but she also tied, uh, tied uh, these uh, talks with uh, with um, political statements, and she has announced that she wants to have a huge EU-China summit uh, with all EU27 uh, countries uh, and champions representatives in the second half of 2020 when Germany will uh, have uh, the EU, uh, EU presidency. Um, on the Japanese side of things, uh, if, we, if you don't talk about the uh, Japan-Korea uh, issue, which, by the way, the Europeans want to avoid as much as possible, both at the EU level but also in the capitals, uh, EU-Japan FTA has entered into force uh, on the 1st of February of this year, and to some extent probably this largest so far FTA uh, uh, in, in general wouldn't have probably happened if there were not, uh, if there wasn't a pressure uh, from the US administration both on Japan and on the EU. Uh, EU-Korea FTA has been in place since 2011, fully implemented since 2015, and it's pretty successful, especially for the, uh, for the EU side. And if I go through uh, the remainder of uh, Asia, we would have also EU-Singapore agreement, uh, EU-Vietnam, 
uh, we also mentioned uh, Australia, New Zealand. So in a way, EU is trying to network all these uh, bilateral relationships instead of creating uh, sort of big, uh, big partnership uh, partnerships as it was uh, possibly uh, the goal uh, before um, uh, Trump administration coming into place. So, uh, just last few words. So, what what what's what's the future? Uh, what could be the problem for uh, Europe uh, is that Europe may be more and more uh, sort of being forced to choose sides uh, between China on one hand and between the uh, on the uh, uh, with the U.S. on the other hand. Um, that should probably be something that you uh, should try to avoid as much as possible and sort of try to um, have a, a sort of a middle relationship with, with both. Um, we'll see how the new commission which will come in place as of 1st of November will uh, go about it. Looks like that the new commissioner will be uh, Phil Hogan, the Irish commissioner, current Irish commissioner for agriculture who's been quite involved in the uh, negotiations of various FTAs uh, with Commissioner Malmström and uh, has done sort of a good job. So uh, there is some, uh, some hope that the commission will, be, uh, do, uh, will continue in its uh, good work. But what, what's probably most important is that uh, the trade should again, uh, there should be again an effort to depoliticize uh, trade, uh, both at the EU level uh, at the, uh, and at the international uh, WTO level. Um, and I will probably stop here. Okay, thank you very much. Um, before I start our Panel discussion, let me just briefly, if you allow me, interpret your presentations and somehow I may be recognized. A pattern that I think you all said that there is some sort of a transition from a rule-based order to a power-driven disorder. We still have a hegemon, this is United States, but it's no longer willing to set the rules, but rather abuse its own still um, big economic power to shape the rules or bend them for its own purposes. We also had a growing complexity that led to diverging interests. So in a sense, we can understand the United States that they no longer see a consensus, so maybe they want to do something about it. And so we should not name and shame them. And you also all somehow identify that there has been a satisfaction in a sense of a liberalization on world scale, which somehow, however, blocks the further deepening of liberalization and somehow turns into dissatisfaction with the status quo. That is on the level of institutions, and I think that what you said or what we can read in uh, world media is also a change on the level of ideas from some sort of a liberal visions that have been driving the WTO reforms and new rounds to some sort of a protectionist fantasies. You know, nobody of you mentioned Brexit, but when the Britain decided to leave two years ago, the fantasy was that we will use the WTO framework to establish better trade deals deals that Europe or the EU prevents us to, um, to conclude. But somehow, meanwhile, the closest transatlantic ally on the second side of the Atlantic decided that it will disrupt the WTO framework. And somehow, Britain nowadays is stuck between leaving the EU, which was not supposedly working, and now uh, diminishing prospect of actually WTO framework that should work, but it seems it doesn't work that good as uh, certain uh, social forces in, or political forces in Britain uh, fantasized about. So having these two trends, the institutional and liberal, here's my question from the position of a small 
and open economies that we all represent, the Slovakia or the Visegrad space, the Czechia or Norway, what should we do? Should we appeal to the rules that are now on the table? Should we find alternatives and possible a coalitions of like-minded states to promote a change that will somehow uh, uh, inspire and collect uh, enough amount of states to somehow uh, balance the U.S. or shall we somehow agree with the United States and as uh, Lem Semenak said, the change will not disappear with Trump. There is probably a trend in, in thinking in U.S. policies. So I came out with three alternatives or um, a ways how to deal this disorder with this disorder from our uh, point of view of small economies or maybe the Europe that should be strong enough to deal with the issues. Maybe you have other ways how to deal with that or maybe you agree with me on one of these three. That is more limited to our space, but you also talk a lot about the future prospects, the climate change, the digital uh, change, the debt issues that could be somehow uh, included into solving the WTO uh, status quo. And my question is, that would be the second one, are you in favor of this holistic solution or rather should we stick to straight to the point, to the trade? Is the holistic one better or should we really solve the real, the so-called real and narrow problems of only the trade? And maybe you already have an opinion, so I won't pick you. You can somehow start to talk if you want. I will start to pick. Uh, Anne, okay. we have an opinion. Yeah, a very big question. So um, I don't have the full uh, solution uh, at the moment. But uh, but I think um, uh, if you kind of uh, look at the trade from a kind of macro perspective, the last. 30, 40 years, uh, the big change is that uh, Asia grew very fast. So that's um, the biggest change of the world economy, and China is on top of the cake there, but of course Asia grew, and that uh, caused uh, to total uh, change in manufacturing production worldwide, changed value chains, everything, uh, so it's a new world. Uh, on the other hand, you have about 100 countries that did not prosper so much. So they were not hurt by trade, in my opinion, uh, contrary, to, contrary to what some people say, but they didn't succeed. So, so you have a kind of long tail of, uh, of countries that did not succeed, and this creates uh, a kind of uh, 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 lack of progress in, in WTO and the world system, and you have, in a way, to address this kind of global imbalances. So I think uh, so the, to have this kind of global perspective on things that uh, growth in Asia was a good thing. Yes, it hurt our jobs, but it was essentially good with the poverty reduction of China and elsewhere. And, but, uh, but we need to address the concerns of all those in Africa and uh, 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 small nations around that didn't succeed so well. So, so I think uh, this is a kind of... Uh, non-trade issue, because you don't grow by trade alone, you don't grow by roads alone. <laughs> if you go to the BRI, you need productivity, uh, investment, skills, etc. And yeah, so, so I would like some more Marshall plans, uh, in a way, for the world to kind of address some of these issues to bring the system onwards. Uh, I would like to have more courage on some of the kind of key issues like like multinationals need rights and obligations. Uh, where the EU is making an effort and 
which is a f the other fundamental change of the world economy, from national economies to investment-driven, multinationals-driven economy with c companies producing all over the place. So, so yeah, so, so these kind of fundamental issues about an inequality on the global scale and about the investment and multinationals are kind of key issues uh, that we have to think of to kind of create a narrative which is kind of appealing. Uh, to re-establish uh, faith in the global system instead of uh, quarrelling with China in a way. Yes, so that's a, yeah, a part, partial. Do you have any opinion, uh, Teresa? If you start it, we can then finish. Uh, yes, um, well, I, I like uh, the end of Anna's presentation where you were talking about uh, mega-regionals and plurilaterals which uh, I think that would be a good way forward, although also even these, they don't seem to be working at the moment, right? So um, that's why I was uh, saying that I think the EU is sort of trying to do uh, the best what it can and sort of to, to have individual bilateral agreements, but network them, connect them as much as possible and that way sort of create a substitute for some kind of a more um, mega regional uh, regional agreement. Um, you also ask about uh, Brexit, uh, right? Um, in, in a way, uh, for countries like uh, the Czech Republic, membership in the EU is the key. And we will see uh, if the UK will be able to uh, survive, if, especially if it doesn't get any deal with the EU, right? So um, this this can be kind of a kind of a negative example of the way how not to go, possibly for the others. Um, and um, also, we should we should uh, look. Uh, you mentioned the coalition of the willing or coalition of uh, like-minded, uh, which, uh, when it comes to the uh, WTO reforms of the applied body, uh, it, it looks like that the EU is trying to meet, uh, team up with Canada to do some kind of substitute mechanism if the applied body gets uh, really deadlocked. Uh, which again, that's that's also a good good way a good way forward. So in a way, yes, uh, um, coalitions and uh, sort of uh, networked bilateral deals uh, would be my answer <coughs> to your question. Great, Mr. Shipko, if he can. So I hope I have had two types of remarks. First, a response to what Arne said. It's true that when you look at distribution of effects of trade, uh, the last 20, 25 years of increased openness have coincided with uh, possibly negative changes in income distributions and in, in uh, what might have caused that some countries appear to be not so much winning from globalization. But it's important to realize that when we look at more detailed analysis, papers by Dietzenbacher and others, it seems that significant part of these changes can be actually explained by technological advances and also by not so much trade but effects or side effects of financial liberalization. So although we may very well understand why voters in the United States were angry about the effects uh, of supposedly uh, China effect on their, on their jobs, even if the trade relations with China are severed, then unless the technological change disappears or there are some changes in financial openness, well, the jobs will not reappear. There will not be any uh, dramatically improved demand for low-skilled or medium-skilled jobs in the United States or in Europe. In fact, it may get even worse with the advance in Industry 4.0 and with additional robotization. Then, specifically about the second topic, specifically talking about the new member states and Brexit and related issues, as a trade economist, again, I would like to remind us that uh, trade relations, in spite of how dramatic and chaotic they can appear to diplomats and political scientists, they actually are often, at some level, surprisingly stable and conservative. 
Indeed, when we try to analyze long series of trade data from about 1820s till today, we can see that basic patterns at some level remain very similar. They are described by the gravity pattern of trade. So we have a pretty good hunch that when we are here in Central Europe, in the Czech Republic, that in future years, the role of China in our exports probably will be somewhere between 1.3 and 1.5 percent of our exports, regardless of the achievements of economic diplomacy or some possible uh, political overtures between the countries. We had similar results for the United States, so regardless of how deep the TTIP would be, we are still getting that the share of the exports to the U.S. for the Czech Republic was somewhere, let's say, between 2 2.5 percent, and most of our trade consistently and very logically remained attracted to EU markets. So for us, the situation is kind of perhaps simpler, uh, but I would not like that to sound too silly. Uh, to some extent, if we manage to secure a regional trade bloc centered on Germany, many of our basic interests and export markets will be to a significant degree related or covered. We will be, of course, facing negative side effects of the fact that German-centered global value chains also sell in the United States or in China. But even these indirect effects can be often, when you try to do some simple uh, calculations or simulations, smaller than many people assume. The huge problem here is that politicians, and I think Mr. Trump is a very nice example, as well as many uh, European politicians, don't really know how to understand and handle numbers. If you are talking about millions or billions of dollars worth of trade, it sounds huge, but compared to how successful we have been in increasing global volumes of trade, we are still often talking about fractions of person. <clears throat> and there is a huge, seemingly invisible volume done by everyday effort of normal uh, companies, normal businessmen, who are not accompanying anybody on special trade missions, which exists and which is driven by entirely rational, pragmatic reasons. And this will not disappear. So from this perspective, as long as the EU doesn't disappear completely and Germany doesn't end up in some spectacular collapse, it's uh, probably that we will not fall into some deep crisis, regardless of what will happen with the rest of the world. Well, <clears throat> it's always a nice discussion about this issue. The first what we should say where we are now. We are living in a hyper-connected world. When we are living in ultra-connected world, we should adopt all measures which are connected. We cannot now, at this stage of development, just discuss about trade. No many more. It should be comprehensive framework. My first comment will, will concentrate on the uh, international trade as a whole. The question is, international trade under the umbrella of GATT was really very successful. The, we uh, deserve so many attention of this trend, no. Trade is net contribution to, to real GDP. We are solving many other issues, but never discuss trade. Trade should take into critical point of development. In which main areas? For the sh short term, it's definitely it's a parade body. When Americans are not keen to solve, so why Europeans are still dreaming about the position. Why don't take a leadership? What they did historically. And also with the other emerging market countries. Regarding the main issue here in, in uh, uh, WTO, we should recognize that small and medium-sized enterprises they are critical. In some countries, like Czech and Slovak Republic, they cover over 80% of GDP. But in uh, Geneva, under WTO, they, do they don't take into consideration because the big brothers, they are playing the critical role. And big brothers, they have very good lawyers, brokers, and everything and small and medium they don't have. So the first, what I would like to recommend to Geneva, 
to concentrate for small and medium-sized enterprises and to support them. The second, e-commerce. It was unsuccessful in Buenos Aires, very sad. Only 75% support it. And then moving to the global area, as I mentioned, we are living in interconnected world. Uh, when this trend will continue, even it's much worse than its expectation in terms of, of climate change, uh, less developed countries, they will need yearly 15% of GDP to finance flooding, drought, and uh, the other issues which are related with climate change. Fifteen, emerging market countries, four percent of GDP. So the question is, where are the money? The answer is clear. Tax haven, corruption, no transparent operation. And if we are going to solve the problem, we should concentrate for tax haven. There are ten trillions of dollars and then we will be able to survive in the planet because we have very many conferences but we are not solving the main issue because the question is whether it's political we all know we understand yeah they should study this the key issue where are the finance finance there are its tax even they are profit sharing of Multinationals, multinationals, they are playing the key role in uh, the global development. If we are not able to solve this problem, then we will move to deadlock. And my message is the World Trade Organization that should be more active, more active, just concentrate for those who are the main contributors to the value added in the international area. Thank you. So holistic solution at the end. Um, we should finish the panel, but I would leave it to the audience. If you have questions and you prefer them to the coffee break, then you can ask question. Anybody has a question? So I see the coffee is more attractive. So let's finish and thank the audience and to our speakers that they were willing to come to Prague and talk. I think it was a very interesting panel and uh, full of very interesting suggestions and questions to be solved in later panels. So thank you. <laughs>